Let us gather in the name of the one who calls us into this place and beyond with saints and travellers and invitations to be the future by St Columba and the patriarchs and all those who have travelled before us. In one great holy community, we meet in this sacred space where all that is almighty curries in close with us all. Hello, I'm Roddy Hamilton, the Minister of New Kilpatrick Parish. And again, as always, we really appreciate you making space for us to worship together. Now this will be our final video service for a while, unfortunately, until perhaps August. But there are four years worth of services in the archive. So feel free to fill in the, the gaps over the summer from our YouTube channel or from the front page of our website. You can access all of that, but that's then. This is now, and we are still with Moses, who is having quite a rage at God, who is raging back, and the people are caught in the middle. And on the outskirts of that is St Columba, whose day it is today, the 9th of June. And in that smorgasbord of faith, let us worship. Holy God, great and almighty one, gracious and full of light, wonder beyond us and confusion within us, yet a breath away, intimate God, closer to us than our beating heart. Together, we create a holy place where the vastness of the universe fits into a word of praise. And it is our praise, our wonder, our awe that binds us to you. May your patience and stillness guide us when we need to be patient, touch us when we need to be still, that we might know you in the presence you are of love and grace and peace. From transcendence to imminence, from beyond us to within us, Holy God, be here, be among us, be between us, within us, around us. And in thankfulness we linger here, comfortable, at home, familiar with your presence, curried in to your person. Holy God, may we grow together closer to each other in community, faith and love. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. This passage happens between the first and second attempts at getting the Ten Commandments. Moses went up first time. He was away too long. The people thought he wasn't coming back, so built a golden calf because Egyptian gods were clearly more powerful. Moses arrives back and is so angry he drops the tablets. This passage is what happens between then and Moses returning with fresh tablets for the commandments. Just to say, everyone is frightened of each other in this passage. They're all angry, they're confused. Both people and God have fallen out with each other. It also feels the story goes backwards at times. It seems that different parts have been slotted in the wrong place. <clears throat> no one put on the ornaments at the beginning, but then they're asked to take them off. Moses talks about God's presence, and God says he hasn't given any presence. It's all very confusing. So what I invite you to do is just sit and listen to what it's trying to say, because there's a story always behind the story. God said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now, take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. Now, Moses used to take the, the tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Moses said, You have been telling me, lead these people. I know you by name and you have found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. God replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. If your presence does not go with us, says Moses, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name, said God. We're losing the story nowadays of these great Old Testament tales where there are a few generations less informed than this one of Moses and Noah and Abraham and Joshua and Gideon. But even as you know, we are less familiar with them as well, though we've been brought up with them. However, there seems to be a revival of interest in the legends and myths of the Greek gods and heroes. I was in a bookshop recently and there was a whole section dedicated to the reimagining of the tales of these heroes, from Achilles to Theseus, from Herodotus to Odysseus. And they make good stories because there are twists and turns, ambition and fallouts, scandal and tricks that have truly become the stuff of legend that we often quote. The Greek gods really knew how to play. All that falling out and falling in. 
they turn to Yahweh. <laughs> the version we tell is not quite as exciting, except, have you read Exodus 33? There's quite a rumble going on. The golden calf has almost broken the relationship between divine and people. God is furiously upset and is on the verge of storming off, calling the people for everything, stiff-necked, intransigent, immovable. It all happened because Moses was gone too long. The people panicked that he'd never come back. Maybe there was no gods at the top of the mountain, so they came together to build an Egyptian one. They understood that Egyptian god. They were familiar with it. But Moses was apoplectic. God was inconsolable and the people petrified. Moses stands in the middle of all of this. The people on one side trembling with fear, God on the other side trembling with anger. Moses doesn't know where to look. This didn't come naturally to him. He was thrown into his, this national leadership job. He was trying to negotiate with children and he had never been good with his own. The people were traumatised. They had just seen the raw face of God and it was an angry God and they knew the result of a master's anger back in Egypt. They knew they had crossed the line. Everything was in disarray. It was, it was a national crisis. The whole project was spiralling down the plug hole and they were going to be left in the middle of nowhere without a God to look after them. So what does Moses do? Well, Moses picks up his tent and pitches it outside the camp. He removes himself from the argument and takes himself beyond the boundary of the camp. It was surely, surely the worst possible thing Moses could do, especially as the whole relationship was collapsing. God had just announced, I will not be with you any longer. And that was when the panic set in. People didn't know what to do or, or what would become of them. It was almost as if they go into mourning. They watch as Moses removes himself from the camp out to the wild side. They stand by their tents as if this is some ritual loss. Surely, at a time of national distress, a leader ought to remain close to the people, not move out. But maybe what Moses was saying to God was, look, what these people need right now is not for me to be close to them. I'm just human like them. I can't sort this. But you are their God. They need you to be close to them. Think about how these people know of you, Moses went on. They're all petrified. And they've, ne they've never experienced you other than from fear. You're the God who turns the Nile to blood, switches out the sun, sends famine. You brought the most powerful empire the world has ever seen to its knees and quite literally put the fear of God into Pharaoh. Then you parted the Red Sea. <laughs> They've never seen you do anything, any other God like that. You visit us with cloud and fire and your voice is always thunder and lightning crashing down from the top of the mountains. I exaggerate the original Hebrew a little here. They were petrified of you. Right now, they don't need a show of almighty power. They need to experience your closeness, not thunder, among the mountains, but your presence in the valleys. So Moses removes himself to make space for God to be found in the midst of the people. Now, there will be other ways of explaining this passage and what is going on. The passage is, in truth, read backwards at times, and it's confusing what happens when. But reading it like this, as Jonathan Sachs suggests, offers us a turning point in how we know God, where what is transcendent becomes imminent. God, vaster than the universe, becomes close. It's from this point in the story that the tabernacle begins to be created, that dwelling place of God in the heart of the camp. It's a massive shift. God changes who God is to the people. God comes close. St. Columba was a saint who spoke of the closeness of God, the, the air we breathe, the, the earth we walk on, the, the, the song of the birds. He recognised the vastness of God and the smallness of ourselves and the world. We still built great cathedrals where you find yourself soaring, which is the impression they wish to give. But saint and patriarch 
knew God in the closeness of our next breath, our heartbeat, among us and between us. At the table, God is close. In the water, God is close. We are able to hold God high, but hold God close too. And Exodus 33 is where that begins to happen. God gets what Moses is talking about and our encounter with God changes. Transcendent becomes imminent, vast becomes tangible, God comes close. Thank you for your partnership in these videos up to now. We've had many years of them now, but as I said, this is going to be the last one for the summer. I'm going to, um, so if you can go onto the website at nkchurch.org.uk and, and look at the archive and go back to visit some of these videos there. They're all there, so please do enjoy them if you wish. Saturday uh, the 15th, we have an event called Story of a Stone. It's 7 p.m. It's a short film included in that as well. Um, the, the festival have been working with us for our anniversary and we're telling the whole story of Bear's Den way back hundreds of millions of years ago, right up to the moment. And it's from a stone that sees all of these things. So it's a, a, it'll be a fabulous wee play. It's only 30 minutes long. It's been going around all the primary schools and it's coming to our hall. Uh, on Saturday the 15th at 7 p.m. and we've included in that a wee short film that some of our local folk have made from the festival as well, some of the young people um, and that will be shown as well. The, there's a flower festival at All Saints and that begins on Friday the 14th all the way through to Sunday the 16th and that's an All Saints church and I recommend that to you and also there is a coffee morning for a uh, support of refugees that's on saturday the 15th in the afternoon in st andrew's church so lots of wee things going on this weekend so please do engage to the extent that you feel comfortable there's a song of praise at 6 p.m in all saints on the 16th um, as well so lots of things going on please do engage with all these things and hopefully we'll see you at the other end of this summer Thank you for your, your, your company uh, through the video. Let's pray for others now. Loving God, the peace we need is here. A world in conflict and in elections needs a place shaped by peace. So may we gather here and seek the peace elections and conflict cannot bring. For those who remember conflict past, D-Day landings and the trauma of war, of conflicts present in the Ukraine and Palestine, Sudan and Haiti, of conflicts to come and the fear we live under, may we all seek a place of peace the world cannot bring. For those voting around the world this year, Decisions that change the shape of the world. Now more frightened of neighbour and stranger for the prejudices elections bring extremism and half-truths. May all have a vision of a peaceable kingdom and choose for that. For those who hunger, thirst, for bread, for justice, for hope. In a world where tables are empty, trade is unfair and a country's resources can be taken with tax paid elsewhere, so the poor become poorer. Dare we have a peace that breaks into and shapes economy? 
for those where climate change is changing everything, where patterns are disrupted, harvests unsure, cycles of seasons shifting. May we live in peace with creation and with the justice and integrity of it too. And for all those who seek wholeness, a safer place to live, a closer community to live in, where neighbours are known and compassion comes naturally, for our families and our friends, those ill and those recovering, coping, coping with bad physical and mental health, among us and between us, may we shape a peace that brings new hope to all our living. So be it. Amen. in peace. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the common life of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.